Hi, my name is Mick Cooper. I'm a professor of counselling psychology at the University of Roehampton. Uh, I'm a practising psychotherapist, counsellor, uh, counselling psychologist, and I've written a number of books on person-centred, relational, uh, existential approaches to therapy. Uh, in this video, I wanted to demonstrate a range of core counselling skills and also to show something of what goes on uh, kind of behind the scenes, if you like, uh, while I'm doing counselling, kind of the, what's, what my thoughts and um, feeling and what I'm trying to do in the counselling. So this video is particularly for um, people starting off on counselling, just to get a sense of how it works, what it looks like, and some of the thinking that goes on behind it. The client uh, in this extract is called Tara. It's not a real client, it's someone acting to preserve an anonymity and confidentiality, just to confuse things. The actor is called Tara, uh, but she's not playing herself, she's playing somebody else, and uh, it doesn't bear any relation to her. Um, what I've tried to demonstrate here is um, how I work. So it's a kind of personal demonstration of my own practice. It's kind of um, based around person-centered ways of working, and you'll see there's lots of listening skills there, empathising, understanding, trying to be very accepting. Um, but it is a personal way of working. And I guess I see my practice as based around what I would call kind of like three R's. So the first part of that is just reflecting, helping clients to reflect on their experiences and understand more about what they experience. Then there's something about reevaluating and thinking about whether the way they're doing things and uh, how they're seeing things is how they want to be or whether there's maybe different ways of doing it. And then the third one, it's not really an R, but it's kind of redeciding, like thinking about, okay, what could I do differently here? So it's quite a kind of action focus maybe more than classical person-centered therapy but it is very much based on trying to understand with clients what's going on for them and uh, how they experience the world. Most of my work is typically face-to-face -face, uh, but this is during the COVID-19 pandemic so it, I'm going to demonstrate work that's been done uh, online via Zoom. Uh, yeah, and before you say it, when you see this, the virtual background definitely could do with some improvement. I wanted something a bit more natural than the uh, background that I've got behind me, but it's something to think about. And there's some great trainings, actually, uh, both kind of long-term and, and, and brief ones on working online. Uh, okay, let's get going. Hi, Tara. Nice to see Hi. you. Hi. Nice to see you, too. So we've got some time together. Uh to just talk about where you're at and what's going on. Where, where, where would you want to start? With? Okay, so you can see here that I'm trying to be smiling, welcoming, maybe I'm doing it a little bit. I'm, I have what's called a resting bitch face. I tend to look quite serious uh, when I'm just concentrating. So I do try and smile to uh, communicate some of the warmth that I'm feeling because I've learned over the, over the years that that's something that I need to do. Um, yeah, that is really important. We certainly know from the research that kind of coming across as friendly, welcoming, uh, valuing is really important, but also <laughs> genuine. And maybe that's something for me to work on. So I start by asking Tara uh, what she'd like to talk about. Um, and that's typically how I'd start a session, just by inviting clients to say a bit about, you know, what they'd like to focus on. Uh, gives me a sense of where they want to go with a session. And I guess also helps them reflect on it maybe a bit and think about how they want to use this time. Uh, rather than perhaps just launching into it and then clients not really knowing or me really knowing uh, where it's going. I mean, a lot of the time clients find they just start and that's great. Um, but but it, it can be helpful, I think. And there's no harm really in asking clients, you know, what would you like to uh, talk about? And I think it's better than sitting kind of awkwardly in silence, both of you kind of sensing that you should be doing something and not quite knowing where to go. So it doesn't need to be a big discussion, but just sometimes something just briefly around what should we talk about today? I haven't been feeling very great recently mm -hmm. and I just have a lot on my mind and I've just been a bit stressed and I wanted to just see if there was something you could help with. Yeah, sure. So when you say stress, can you tell me a bit more about that? I think for me, listening at the start sessions is just so important, really trying to get a sense of the whole story about what's going on. Um, trying to feel my way into the story you'll see that a lot in this session really trying to feel my way in and, and 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 giving the client space to talk so that i can get a sense of the story and then begin to explore that with them at not just their kind of intellectual level but also an emotional level and of course you know if clients are struggling to talk then sitting there in silence and then one of the things i've learned is that it's not always helpful um, sitting there in silence if clients are struggling to talk that it's important to give that balance between giving clients space but also not letting them sit in a kind of stewing or awkward silence can we, we've learned from our research that can be really uncomfortable 
uh, for clients. But, you know, Tara seems to be able to talk about what things going on. She doesn't seem too uncomfortable. So it feels good to be able to give her space and just really listen in. What you can also see here I'm starting to do is to help her what I'd call unpack her story. And that's just to kind of talk more about how she's feeling. Uh, you know, if you imagine kind of boxes in the attic and I'm just kind of going up in there in the attic and opening up these boxes and seeing what's in there and just helping her to lay out, if you like, and, and, and what, what, what things are like for her. And particularly, as you'll see, around how she's feeling. What kind of stress? What's that been about? Well... Obviously exams, <laughs> uh, but also it's just, I haven't been having all my friends around recently and it's been a bit difficult, especially because exams are coming up and I don't have my friends around to support me like I usually do. Yeah. So what happened? Tell me about your friend. One, tell me a bit about your friendship group and what your friends are like. Um, so they're really cool. That is a really, really awful fake smile, isn't it? <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, definitely something to work on. So we were together in year seven, and then we've been in the same class throughout, except for this year. So I'm just really listening, just really trying to take in Tara as well, just trying to get a sense of, you know, what's it like being Tara in this world? How does she experience her world? What does it feel like? How does she perceive it? What's the kind of complexity of things around her? And I'm just trying to give her that space um, to talk so that I can immerse myself in it. I'm not um, kind of coming in with new ideas or asking lots of things. Not because that's not necessarily helpful, but just because the first thing I want to do is really to understand the depths of it, the depths of it. And you can't get there if you're talking too much as a counsellor. Uh, so there's five of us. And... Um... Yeah, they're really nice. We have fun. We like to hang out together. And we're just very, very close. Yeah. yeah. So you've been close for a long time with them. Yeah. Yeah, and you said, wow. And then, yeah. but then what's happened? That they're not around so much at the moment with the exam? Well, we're not in the same class right now. Um, so it's a bit harder to hang out because we have different timetables. and. I don't know, they're just, they're not, they're not really f free to hang out with me at the moment, mm -hmm. I guess. So I'm just listening, I'm clarifying, I'm summarising. What's going on for me here is I'm thinking much less in terms of, I'm not thinking, oh, what should I be doing here or any specific t techniques or interventions or strategies or anything. It's far too early for me for that. But I'm just trying to really talk to her, have a conversation with Tara. Um, get a sense of how she's experiencing her world and and then genuinely asking herself, is it like this? Is it like this? And again, you know, you can think about that as summarising or empathising about somebody, but really it's just having a conversation and just saying, you know, what's it like? And and that's what I'm trying to do is, is get that sense of that lived experience. You used to hang out and you used to spend a lot of time together and you, it's kind of like been like that for the years five of you and now it sounds like what you're saying is that people are around a little bit less and that's kind of making the exams more stressful as well well yeah because if i have a problem usually i just go and talk yeah. to them and then when we hang out it makes me relax a little bit more but now that we can't hang out i just feel that i don't know what to do so what's going on is i'm starting to get more of a sense now um of, of what's going on for Tara um that that yeah she's talking about this revision period it's stressful for her and that kind of links in with her friendships because her friendship group and her links with her friends is often a way for her of dealing with the stress but that's not there anymore and uh, and therefore she's feeling more stressed I can kind of begin to start to sense that to feel that and that feels good I feel like I'm kind of getting on track a bit because I'm having a sense of how things are for her and also I, I just miss my friends Mm -hmm. yeah so you haven't been seeing them as much no that's a, <laughs> the technical term for that is that's a really crappy reflection um it's very kind of on the surface level just kind of talking about details and i guess that's me kind of struggling a bit to really understand something again at the more kind of felt level and just kind of saying something for the sake of it but um it's not helpful it, you got the exams coming up yeah uh-huh and how are you feeling about that 
I mean, stress, I guess, like everyone. Yeah. Um, I've been, I've been studying a lot. So you can see here that I'm still struggling a bit to really get alongside her. And what I'm doing again is asking a factual question. Um, it is about her feelings. I do ask about her feelings. But it's kind of a bit left field. You can sense it's not really connected to uh, what she's saying. It's not really kind of coming out of what she's saying because I'm struggling a bit to get alongside her and get that felt sense. You know, and we can't always get the felt sense. Sometimes, um, as well as where we're at, clients are sometimes more or less connected with their emotions. And, and if they're not, then it becomes more difficult to get that felt sense. But that's really what I'm trying to do is experience that felt emotional world as Tara experiences to understand really what's important for her. I think I'll be okay. I hope I'll be okay. But it's, yeah, you never know. You never know. Mm -hmm. So you worried about not doing so well or? Well, yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to bring out more of the feeling here, perhaps, you know, her worry, her anxiety about not doing well, I'm trying to get that sense of that red thread of what the emotions are and pretty much always when clients come to us and they've got concerns or issues it's not just the kind of cognitive uh rational worry i mean certainly there's rational elements of it but you know at the, at the depth of it there's there's a feeling there's a feeling whether it's uh, worry or sadness or frustration that means that things don't feel right and when you're starting off counts particularly when you're starting off i think it's very easy to get caught up in the kind of logic or the story or the narrative and and sometimes what can get lost is the emotion the feeling and the, the kind of what's really going on for that person in terms of um how they feel and 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 when you're responding when you're inviting a client to talk always thinking about how can you find ways of helping them to talk about their emotions and their, their feelings and maybe some of the things that are more difficult to talk about you know one of the ways that I think about counseling and what counseling skills do is it gives clients a chance to talk about things that maybe they can't talk to uh, other people in their lives about um, often that you know factual conversations are quite straightforward to have um, or to you know talking about the weather talking about relationships talking about what happened Talking about your feelings is more difficult. Um, often it's hidden and often people don't know exactly what their feelings are. So if, they, if you're talking to a counsellor or someone practising counselling skills, it can be a chance to bring those things out uh, more. And in a sense, I see my job as a therapist to help clients talk about things that they find difficult to talk to other people about. I, I am a little bit stressed because of the exams, because if I don't, if I don't have the grades I need to get to get in, yeah. I'm not too sure what I will do. So just as you're listening to Tom, I mean, what's your sense of what she's feeling? Um, I mean, I guess I'm beginning to get more of a sense of just the anxiety, uh, things going wrong with not doing well in her exams. And if I start to feel that myself, some of that kind of what I've called embodied empathy, really feeling that anxiety, maybe that tightness of, I've got to get this right in this situation and again for me that's a good sign that I'm connecting with the client and understanding something uh, of their world but of course different people would understand different things and it's less about kind of getting it right and knowing exactly what clients are experiencing and more about the dialogue being able to feed that back and working together to get closer and closer to really helping the client articulate what it is. My friends they're very hard working like me so usually we'd go study together and then we'd help each other out but um, I've been studying by myself. Yeah, so I'm starting to get just that felt sense within myself of, you know, this really being half a tar and, you know, that's a good sign. It means I'm connecting with what she's wanting to talk about. That's make me even more worried about the exams because I don't have my friends to help me with the tests and help me quiz me and everything. So it's, I'm not used to that, I yeah. guess. You see here that we're, Coming back to something that Tara's already said, but you know that feels good, and it's something that clients often do. Uh, as we're kind of getting into more meaningful stuff, deeper feelings, that counselling and talking is often less of a kind of linear uh, process and more of a circling. You think about water going down a drain. <laughs> That's not a very good analogy. I don't mean that emotionally, but just that kind of circling process that you go round and round something, and each time deepening it. Somewhere. So what happens when you study by yourself? I start to drift off a little bit. So I'll, I'll try to study, I'll try to read my book and then 
I will stop thinking about something else. So I will go on Facebook, I'll go on Instagram. So I think I'm getting more of a sense now why study's hard for Tara when her friends aren't about and, uh, you know, why that ends up being stressful for her. Whereas it sounds like when you had your friends about and when you do revision with your friends, you concentrate more and you can kind of get, get yeah. more into it. Yeah, because we all, we all working together. So we know that the whole afternoon is just us working together and we push each other to do a bit better, I guess. So you can see me working with Tara to try and clarify what's going on. And what comes next from me is a summary uh, to check out that understanding. And but again, it's about kind of going back to those circles. It's about going round and round, but just getting clear each time. Spiral, spiral, <laughs> not going round in circles, going round in spirals and getting deeper and deeper uh, into the reality of her life. Um, and it, it's, it's a process, you know, I, I have a sense that it's going okay because I'm sensing more of an emotional connect with it. If I wasn't sensing that emotional connect, I think that as a counsellor, that's when I start to worry is when I don't feel that emotional connect because it feels like I'm not understanding what's really important to the client at that particular point in time. It's that emotional connect that gives me a sense of what they're talking about and what we're working on is important here. And then you can see Tara's taking it forward again introducing something new so it's about there's something about when you're revising with your friends you can actually do more and you can focus more and concentrate more and get more done and then there's also something about like you can talk to them about the process and what you're worried about yeah because when we revise together we'll we'll be revising but we'll also be chatting and it's just more fun we yeah. do different stuff and it's hanging out with my friends so it's so that reflection seems about right and where do you feel yeah. at the end of the day? You don't feel, do you feel like you haven't done a good job? I've, well, yeah, obviously I feel like I haven't studied like I should have. Okay, and then that's where the stress is. So I have a timetable for my revisions, but I often don't reach the target that I want to. And then I end up trying to make this time up when I get back home and I haven't been sleeping very great, so. Right, right. Just, yeah. So presumably that doesn't help not sleeping very well. Yeah. And what's happening? What, what's happening with your? So what's happening with you? Just explain a bit more. So why has it changed with your friendship? Why aren't you doing revision together? Is it a practical thing, or is it something that's happened in the friendship group that has kind of thrown mm -hmm. things out a bit? I don't know. We haven't had a fight or anything. Um, we didn't have any arguments, but I guess they just they don't have the time anymore. They're busy with other stuff and they don't really have time to meet up. So having understood more about the issue, I'm now inviting Tara to say more about the kind of broader, the overall context of what's going on. And I guess what you could say that what I'm doing now, maybe implicitly rather than explicitly, is what I would kind of call therapeutic leverage, which is a bit of a mechanistic term leverage, but I quite like it. It's something about the kind of areas in which things aren't quite working out and where we might be able to work on and where we can help clients improve things in their life. Um, I guess th th perhaps there's something with a friendship group, you know, what I'm thinking is maybe there's something with a friendship group that has broken down. Uh, and perhaps that's something that if we can sort and look at things in her friendship group, then perhaps that will help her get back to a uh, previous study. But it may be that that's not uh, the solution but it just seems that that would be an area that'd be worth exploring and, and, and seeing where things may have gone wrong so it's a bit leading you know you're probably not classical person centered practice but I think it's this thing about you know when I'm working with clients I'm thinking where where can we where can I be helpful where are the points that we might be able to change something where the client with all the best in the world is doing their best, but maybe there's ways that they can be doing things that would be more helpful for them. And of course, you know, that's not more helpful for them in my eyes, but in their eyes and that things which will really genuinely help. It's a bit harder to be able to convince everyone to meet up. Yeah. So do you feel like you're kind of trying to convince people to meet up and they're maybe more reluctant? Yeah, 100%. I'm always the one texting everyone, asking can we meet up? Should we do something? Okay, so that doesn't sound brilliant. Uh, how does that feel? Well, it's a bit annoying because I, when they want to meet up, I'm, 
I'm um, obviously yes. So it does sound like there's something a bit more going on here that Tara does sound I can kind of pick up that she's a bit resentful uh, or maybe a bit hurt towards her friends. It's not really how friends are meant to be like. Yeah. Because I'm there for them all the time. Do you feel that they're not there for you at the moment? No. So that's quite a strong statement I make there and perhaps pushing things a bit too far. But, you know, my sense is it is what's going on for her. And uh, Tara pauses and I think it connects with something in her. We need to be a little bit cautious because, um, you know, there's a power dynamic in the therapy relationship that makes it uh, difficult for clients saying, no, that's not right. I don't agree with you. So when clients seem to agree with us, you know, it may be actually that they're just um, trying to appease us. But uh, if clients come back to it a number of times, it's, it's generally because it has touched something important. It feels like I don't have best friends at the moment. Yeah, that's a big thing, isn't it? So from feeling like these people are your really good friends, you know, they're your best friends and they've been there forever. And now you're kind of questioning that a bit, aren't you? Well, yeah, because, I mean, we spend what, five, six years being together all the time. And I, I don't get it because there wasn't any issues. It's not like we had arguments or anything. And I don't understand why they're doing this now. You can see here that I'm going for where, you know, maybe the emotion is and trying to draw out uh, what the stronger feelings might be. I don't think I've changed. I'm the same as last year. I can sense some emotion in Tara here about this. They, they went to, to a few parties without me and they didn't even invite me. And we have this group chat on WhatsApp and nothing was on the group chat. So I think they have another chat, but without me. You can see in my face there and in my expression, but, uh, you know, just being struck by the emotion here, which again, for me, is, is a sign of being connected. Um, you know, it does sound pretty painful. It sounds, you know, being excluded, being left out, sounds really horrible. And you can see that quite quickly, we've got down to some of these quite kind of nub issue about feeling excluded from our friends that originally what was an issue about not being studying, able to study very well, we've moved down into some of the more complex and deeper feelings. So it feels like they're having conversations and that they're kind of not inviting you, not, not wanting you. Yeah, and I saw some stories on Instagram and they have been hanging out. But when I try to organise it, they just say they don't have the time. Yeah, how does that feel? Well, not great, but... Yeah. So again, we're getting down now into some of the deeper feelings, perhaps here, rejection, exclusion, uh, hurt. Um, but let's just pause for a minute. Let's just think, you know, why are we doing this? Why go into these feelings? They're not particularly pleasant feelings. So why go into some of these more painful, more difficult, perhaps less expressed feelings? And I guess where I'm coming from, and it's not the only way of viewing counselling or counselling skills by any means, but it's that clients have a lot of things going on for them. And often these are things that they don't particularly share with anyone. And that can feel a real burden. Uh, it can partly feel a real burden because it can feel just all these kind of things stuffed into you. And um, sometimes if you don't have anyone to talk about with it, you can't get it out. And often clients talk about getting things off their chest and just that process of getting things out there can be quite a relief. Uh, and like, like a kind of bot not being bottled up, for want of a better word. And I guess it's also something about that if you have feelings that you're not talking to anyone about or, or thoughts it could be that people don't know about it it can leave you feeling very alone and isolated so that it's not just for instance that you feel sad or in Tara's case that she feels excluded but um, it's also kind of a sense of feeling uh, alone and then feeling alone because you can't tell anyone that you feel alone so you feel kind of on your own with those feelings as well so if that's something that I can here and that a counsellor, somebody doing counselling can listen and just allow to be expressed, then it doesn't get rid of necessarily those primary feelings. It doesn't make everything okay, but it does mean those secondary feelings of feeling alone or isolated or maybe ashamed for having those feelings. 
can be eased a bit and feeling more kind of integrated, feeling more coherent, feeling more like yourself and that it's okay to have those feelings. Um, there's also something then that if we can explore those feelings and allow clients to talk about things that haven't been said, then it allows them to address things in their life, but address the things that really matter for them. You know, if, client, if Tara is able to talk about the fact that actually what's really uncomfortable and unpleasant for her is that she feels excluded, and maybe that's something she's kind of aware of but hasn't quite admitted to herself or admitted to her someone else. She talks about that, she puts it into words. And then we can think about, okay, what can you do with that? And we can focus in on what the real issue are, the real things that are causing her upset, uh, rather than perhaps the more surface level things that actually if we address that wouldn't really change much. Um, you know, revision schedules might not change much because actually it's not dealing uh, with the uh, exclusion uh, and, and, and the isolation that actually is the real thing that's upsetting Tara. And is there part of you that are you kind of feeling like, right, I am being excluded here or <clears throat> they're not wanting me? Or is it part of you thinking maybe it's just how I'm seeing it and actually things are fine? Or you do you feel fairly certain that something is going on? That's a long and uh, not particularly helpful response from me. I think with something like that, there's a real risk of communicating to a client uh, that you don't believe them, and uh, you know, particularly early on in a, in a in a relationship, like you're saying to them, "Where well, you're just imagining this," and uh, even if not, if it's not what we mean, it's easily what clients can hear. The more I think about it, the more I think those are pretty dumbass thing to say I guess what I was trying to do what was I trying to do I was trying to you know I know that some clients at the same time can recognize in certain situations that um you know that maybe they are exaggerating or perceiving something that maybe isn't there and I did genuinely want I mean it came from a genuine place of not knowing uh, as most of my questions do, I think all my questions really come from, you know, I'm not asking a question as a technique, it's because I genuinely don't know, I genuinely want to understand more. And I genuinely, genuinely wanted to get a sense of whether for Tara, uh, she felt that maybe she was exaggerating a little bit of what was going on, and actually that really was what was going on, which is uh, what she described. And I guess it's also, it does feel important for me that, 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 when we think about things like projections and and you know clients projecting onto situations that rather than us as therapists as counselors uh making the call on that that we have that dialogue with clients and see what clients think about that but i'm not going to justify it too far because uh yeah it, it, i don't think it was very helpful i don't think it's how i see it because well it's happening is that I think before before they went to the parties, I, I was definitely thinking that I was just being paranoid and it was just in my head because technically we didn't have a fight or anything. So I think from Tara's response, fortunately, she's not too offended or upset by uh, my comments. And she, but she, and she does just clarify, which is great that she comes back that, um, you know, it is definitely something going on. And I think what's important here, what I, I'm pleased that I do is that I go with what she's come back with. There's been very interesting research on ruptures uh, with clients when things do go wrong. And what they show is that if we can uh, um, kind of accept what clients say, maybe apologise, rather than kind of sticking to what we said and what we've done that has maybe upset or thrown the counselling, that things can get back on track. It's a bit like kind of bringing up a kid that perhaps is less about always getting things right and more about being able to acknowledge when we get things wrong and, and correct it and Get, get back into a relationship, into, into a dialogue with someone, rather than sticking to our guns, no matter what the feedback. And I can imagine, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I can imagine that when you're trying to revise and when you're trying to do your work, <coughs> the part of the issue is that you've got this at your back of your mind, like this quite upsetting thing with your friends about, uh, am I being kind of left out here and being excluded, is something happening? Yeah, and it, I think since it happened more than once, when I invite them to my house to revise and they say no and then i go on instagram and stories i tend to just go and check a little bit more she's listening to this again i'm not quite sure what she's saying actually but i do get a sense of some of the emotion and some of the feelings again of being excluded what you see here is also that from here having gone into some of the emotions is that i do invite her to think about what might be the best way forward on, on a kind of more i guess behavioral level and I guess you could say that 
that could be a bit too leading or a bit too directive. But it's something that I do uh, ask clients, you know, how do you think we can move forward from here or what, what's your sense of what would be the best thing to do uh, to look at where they go? Um, and it, again, it's a genuine question. I don't have answers to that or where they should go. But I, it's about kind of, again, I guess thinking about therapeutic leverage and, 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 and working out better ways for the client. Uh, for them to um, do things. And my sense from the research is that clients do value that at times. Uh, not all the time, um, and not if it gets in the way of understanding and if it's not too quick, but um, when once clients have understood things and they feel that we've understood things, often they do want to look at solutions and ways forward and, and how to address it, uh, rather than just staying perhaps with the feelings per se. Do you have a sense then of what's best to do around this at this point? Well, no, because I'm just, I don't know, because I don't want to, I don't want to have an argument with them. Yeah. But at the same time, I do want to hang out with them. So it's just, I feel like I'm a bit trapped because I don't know what to do. There's no good solution. So Tara says here that there's no good solution. And in a way, that's not surprising. I always think with clients that if they had a good solution, they probably wouldn't have come to us and talked about it. Generally, the issues or problems clients come to us with and uh, are complex and they're difficult. And, uh, and I don't expect myself to have an easy answer because I kind of think if I reckon that I've got an easy answer, that's a bit disrespectful to clients in a way. You know, am I, am I some kind of brilliant intelligence above and beyond them that... You know, I can see uh, easy answers where they can't. Generally, things are complex. Um, but if they can explain it to me and I can understand it and understand it at a felt level, then it's something that we can work out. So just to reiterate, you know, I'm really not thinking here, oh, if only Tara did X or Y, and I'm not, and I'm, I'm, it's not just that I'm not thinking that, I'm not, try, I'm not trying to work out a solution because I'm assuming that solutions are probably fairly complex that I need to understand all the different parts, that there's probably good reasons why clients are doing some of the things that are also kind of problematic. And it's going to take a little bit of time to uh, to unpack, unpick it, but I have some faith in that. Um, what Tara goes on to talk about now is her thoughts about next year, uh, where she's hoping to be at a university and, and how she thinks that she's going to be quite isolated there. And it's, again, it's quite interesting. And, and you'll see that there's also, again, perhaps some opportunities for, for some therapeutic leverage there. And I don't know, I think, yeah, I'll just be at the library a lot or in my room. And I was kind of hoping for this year to be a bit of a, a nicer change. Yeah. So you're hoping for this year to be like, a really good year lots of parties lots of going out lots of socializing partly because you're kind of thinking that next year it's going to be less social and you'll have less people to hang out with yeah and i mean they say uni is a bit harder to make friends so i know the timetables are very different from what it is now and there's i feel like now it's it was very easy to make friends with them because we were in the same class and we've known each other for so long by uni it's a bit different and there's going to be all those random people that i don't know so one of the things that tara says there is about it being harder to make friends at university she says oh well, people say it's harder to make friends at university and actually my reaction to that is oh i didn't know i didn't know that and then i actually think actually i'm not sure that's true but i'm noticing that that's her assumption it's harder to make friends at university and then a number of things kind of click into place like why she feels so much pressure for things to be good now because she's kind of feeling like that's her last chance and then it's all going to kind of be downhill from here. And I guess, again, then I'm thinking about this in terms of, or I'm feeling, not even consciously, but it seems like a point of therapeutic leverage because maybe that's something that can be challenged, this assumption that things are, you know, friendships aren't going to be possible at university. And actually, maybe if she can feel that, actually, you know, at university, maybe I'll have better friendships and that will take off some of the pressure that she's feeling at the moment. Yeah. yeah yeah so you're kind of torn in a way because on the one hand you're feeling like these are my only friends if i don't have them i'm gonna have no one but then you're feeling like these are people who maybe aren't being that good friends anymore and uh, it's kind of hard to hold on to that friendship well it's it scares me a bit because they all have 
they all have other friends to hang out with. They're fine with the people in their class. And I don't know why I, I feel like they don't need me. But yeah. I'm always running after them all the time. I'm yeah. always the one making the effort. So that feels quite a profound and quite an emotive statement, emotional statement. I just want to stay with it with her. Because when you think about not wanting to be around you, if that's what it feels like, they don't want to be around you. Like, why would that be? I know you're kind of a bit confused by it, but is that because you think maybe you're not fun or a bit shy, a bit? Yeah, I think, I do think that Maybe they don't feel like I bring much to the group. So I've invited Tara to explore how this links to her self, sense of self. And often, as is often the case, it brings out some quite deep and perhaps, you know, really unexpressed feelings about how she sees herself. Often it's a very fertile area of exploration is about someone's self-perception and, 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 and is a touchstone for a lot of other things that clients feel. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess I'm the vanilla flavor of the group a little bit. The vanilla flavor. Yeah. Can you say a bit more about that? No, I guess I'm just the, I don't know. I don't want to say that just the lamppost of the group where I'm just there, but cause I, I do, I do, I do hang out with them and I, I, I I do make myself hurt and stuff like that, but it's just, I'm not the most vocal out of the group. So you can see here, you know, that there are really are some deeper connections to uh, how Tara sees herself. That is that how you feel you are kind of like outside of that friendship group is someone that people can just kind of take or leave, bit vanilla, a bit, bit unseen? I think so. And as I was saying, that, that feels some very fertile ground for further work. So we're just jumping a bit forward now in this session to something a little bit later. And it's coming back to the question of what Tara might do differently. So I wonder if there's a, what, what can you do differently? I don't know, I guess just kind of stand up for myself, maybe a little bit more. And then... If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Yeah. What What would that mean, standing up for yourself? Well, with my friends, just maybe instead of being so chill all the time, maybe call them out a little bit more when they're not doing something that's very nice. And just, I don't know. I mean, I guess there would be, you know, some people might say, well, one thing to do would be to, you know, to be really clear and just say, look, you know, I, I'm, you, you're getting on with stuff. You're doing stuff without me. I feel really upset about it. Um, you know, it, it, I feel really, you know, I feel left out by it. Um, is there something going on? Is there something that, you know, that I've been doing or about me that, you know, you don't like? And to really kind of face into, I mean, I'm not saying you should do that, but I guess that's one option, isn't it? Is to, you know, to, to, to rather than, as you say, kind of going on with it, because it sounds like through your life, the, the way that you've dealt with things is by going along with it, trying to be, you know, a good girl and, you know, getting it right for other people. But yeah. I guess some people would just say, you know, okay, look, this is what's going on for me and, and kind of standing up, standing up to it. And, uh, you know, they, I mean, there's consequences. I guess it's a difficult time for you. You've got exams and going on and it may not be what you want to be doing right now. Um, but I guess that is one of, geez, that's quite a spiel. You know, that's the kind of one you just put your head in your hand and go, I mean, shut up, <laughs> just stop talking. You know, it's, it's kind of advice giving. It's coming from a very external frame of reference. Really doesn't feel particularly helpful. But I guess what I'm trying to do is, is bring to Tara one possible way of responding to the challenges around her. And, you know, couching it in a way which is not entirely authentic. I don't, I don't like that about either, which is, but it's, it's trying not to say this is what you should do, but, you know, here's a possibility. Um, 
you know, I don't like it and it feels, it doesn't feel good. But I, at the same time, I have learned from the research over the years that clients really can appreciate uh, counsellors introducing different ideas, different possibilities, uh, suggestions, advice. Clients can appreciate advice a lot. Um, I think it has to come from a deep understanding uh, of what clients are experiencing and, and, and thoughts then about where they might go. But in the right place, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I know in certain models, person centered that particularly it's not seen as it's not seen as consistent with a model because you're really trying to work with the inner experiencing perceptions of the client rather than introducing something external. But what I've seen in the research is, is a lot of clients really valuing uh, advice from clients, in, in, indeed including, which is a paradoxical thing, from person-centred counsellors, that kids in person-centred counselling again and again and again say what they love is the counsellor's advice, even though the counsellors were blind, that they never gave a word of advice. Yeah, I think I just have to stop being such, like, like a pushover. And I'm not a pushover, but just saying yes to everything and just being okay with all this happening and not just standing up a little bit more for what I think is right and what I think is not right. Yeah. It sounds like you're trying to call them out, but maybe you haven't done it as kind of forcefully or as clearly as... Yeah, I think it was very much... I didn't want to upset them and I didn't want them to gang up on me like they usually do. So I just... I just... I, I guess I'd rather not cause any wave and just wait and see but then nothing has changed and it keeps happening so yeah. maybe that wasn't the best thing to do well it's understandable i guess if you if, if things can change by not creating any waves that's brilliant if that can happen but what you're saying is that it hasn't really shifted stuff no not at all nothing is the same yeah so, so it's, it's i guess the options are that you you know that that carries on and it probably will carry on or you try and call it out more forcefully yeah i'm just scared that if i do so then i'm gonna end up like really alone this time and then i just i just i'm just scared it's gonna backfire a little bit yeah so that's why i'm i'm not really that's why i'm so scared of doing it because i'm just scared that if what if they're like okay then bye or we don't we don't want to we don't want to hang out with you anymore, then what do I do? So I guess there is a real risk here. And again, I'm not coming into it with a sense that there's easy answer. I genuinely, I genuinely, I genuinely don't know what is best for Tara to do in this situation. I've got some ideas. Um, I have a sense that she does that, you know, that maybe some things are a bit better than others. And also that doing nothing uh, isn't particularly helpful. So there's a need to kind of work it out. And it, it's like anything, I guess if you spend some time looking at anything, you get some better ideas about it. Um, you know, if you spend some time looking at a car manual, you'd learn more about a car. And in the same way, if you spend some time looking at a problem, then you get some better ideas, ideally, about what to do. But it's not easy, and uh, I'm not expecting easy answers. But I am happy to work with her to look at the alternatives and to weigh them up. And if this was an ongoing relationship, then we'd be... Um, trying things out, she'd be trying things out, maybe she'd come back and say, well, I talked to my friends and this happened and they did that and they said that and then we'd look at other options. So um, so over time, I guess we find some some ways forward, maybe not solutions, but ways forward. And what you see following on from this is that we then come back to another area of therapeutic leverage that was opened up earlier, which was about whether maybe she could um, reflect on this expectation that universities uh, going to be a really difficult time for meeting friends and to look at that and again I'm not assuming that that's wrong or it's a pathological belief but it did just kind of strike me as a bit well it, it, uh, not necessarily true not necessarily true maybe a way of framing it that I, I kind of thought well it doesn't have to be that way therefore I'm thinking maybe that's something that could be useful to explore and maybe challenge and maybe she'll convince me that actually she's right and maybe it'll change my how I assume things but I'm willing to kind of pick it up and discuss it with her because I do think something that you've been saying about um you know that I don't think things you, you can't see things developing in university and you know to do some work around opening up more for new relationships and perhaps establishing new friendships 
rather than feeling yeah. like you got to hang on to what, what's there. I guess if I'm not friends with them anymore, I kind of, I'll be forced to find new friends. Yeah. It's just, I think it's going to be difficult. Yeah. But yeah. I can't know until I try, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I kind of, I'm struck by that sense of it's going to be really difficult finding new friends and making new friends. And I do just wonder how much that comes back to, you know, how you see yourself as a friend and what you think that you got to offer, maybe feeling you don't have as much to offer. Because it sounds like what you said about yourself is that, you know, you've got some really good qualities. You're very caring. You know, you're somebody who can talk to people that, that you know, people can get a lot from a friendship with you from what you're describing. So I feel like, sorry, I feel like this is something that, When, when you meet someone for the first time, you don't really care if they're caring. It's something that you would want in the long term. But when I'm going to meet people at university, at parties and stuff like that, they won't care that I'm caring. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's why it would be difficult to make friends because with them, they know I'm caring because we've been together for so long. Right. But what do you think they'll see then in you that made me will make them feel that well, I'm not so sure I want to be friends with this, but is it, is it because you're quieter? Yeah. And then if they want, I feel like sometimes if, if they don't approach me, I'm not going to be the one who's going to be like, Hey, hi, how are you doing? My name's Sarah. That's just. Yeah. yeah. Who I am. So it feels like maybe when people see you for the first time, because you're not kind of so exuberant and extroverted, that they'll not be so interested and they maybe won't get to know you and they won't get to see that you're caring. Well, yeah. Yeah. Because I feel like this is something that you find out with time. But in that kind of environment, everything's very fast paced and it's not, people are not going to stop for someone who's caring. Yeah. So I understand what you're saying more now, because what you're saying is one of the things that's precious about these friendships is the fact that people have known you over time. So they've got to see your caring side. So that quality has really come out. And I think one of your fears is in new relationships is that people aren't going to see that for a long time. And that they, they may never see that because what they'll judge or what they'll think about is just your first impressions, really, which, which and what they'll want to see is somebody kind of more extroverted and more outgoing. Yeah. And I'll never get to know that kind of more caring side. So you can see what I'm trying to do here is really understand the logic or what I'm, uh, Ronnie Lang, the existential therapist, called intelligibility, the kind of thinking, the intelligence behind the client's feelings and behaviours, the kind of underlying logic and rationale for why she's doing what she's doing and perhaps encountering the problem she is. I, 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 I strongly believe that and clients are doing their best um, but doing the best isn't always the best thing that someone can do sometimes with the best will in the world we do things that actually aren't that helpful for us and therefore talking about it finding different ways of doing it getting some input can help us do things better um, so I think there is a place in counseling for challenging maybe misperceptions misunderstandings that clients have um, but before any I, I do that it needs to come from within the client's uh, understanding of the world, not just from an external frame of reference, from my frame of reference, thinking, well, do this, do that, think about this, think about that, but really immersing myself in the client's world. And then from there, maybe trying to understand and challenge and question some things. But that kind of means that you're, in a way, you're, I don't know, almost trapped by the relationships that you've had so far. Like that's almost that, that's is all where you're possibilities for friendship lies because it feels like you kind of think maybe there's you know it's not going to get to that point again well yeah and that's why I really wanted that's why I don't want to risk maybe losing them because then what if I never have that again then I'm just losing the and I feel like with them maybe it's just a question of time I maybe then they're not being very nice right now, but maybe next year they'll be fine once we go out or for uni and we come back. Yeah. So it could be that if you just leave it and let it go and don't if I just, like hold on to it and just like wait until we go to uni. Because at the end of the day, 
they not going to the same uni, so they're not going to hang out anyway. So yeah, so you could just leave it and wait and see what happens. After yeah, after we go. And that maybe it will come back, and you know that there, there, there will be that closeness there again. So we're coming to the end of this session now, and I'm inviting Tara to spend a few minutes summarising and bringing things together. So what do you think? We're, we're kind of coming towards the end, and you know, you you talked a lot about your life and where you're at, and you know, wanting to study for the for your A levels, but that it's been difficult in many ways because of um, it's been hard to do kind of revision set differently and that you're doing that you're on your own and then there's kind of stuff going on in the back of your mind about you know what's happening with your friendship group and i can hear that the stuff with your friendship group is quite upsetting at the moment and i can also you know we've talked about some kind of resonances between that and maybe what happens with your family and kind of maybe that there's some of the same processes about how you are and perhaps not not challenging things What's your sense of maybe where you, you can take things following our conversation? Well, I think I'll I'll try to talk to Amina or Sarah and see see if I can find out maybe what happened or why they're doing this. I feel like there's no point in just waiting around now. I am going to wait around, but I'd rather know why. So maybe I can try to find a solution for it rather than just living in the shadows until they get over it. So, yeah. So again, rather than living in the shadows until they get over it, just being a bit more proactive. Yeah, and that maybe if it is something I did, then I can apologize for it or I can understand what happened. And so I think I'll definitely speak to one of them. Yeah. I... Okay. It sounds like maybe there is something about being a bit more kind of proactive. You you're really used to kind of trying hard and 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 kind of going along, trying your hardest to go along with things. And maybe there is something about a kind of slight shift in how you do things about kind of addressing things and maybe not feeling like you always have to go along with everyone else. Yeah, hundred percent. I feel like I think I'll try to just make myself heard a little bit more because right now whatever I'm doing right now is not working very well yeah okay and how, how does it feel talking about things over the last hour or so it's good I mean it's not like I usually talk to my friends and because they're not there it's just I haven't it's not like I can talk to anyone else about this so it's good to have it's good to unload everything and then also you don't know them and you don't know how we are so it's just easier because it's more of a a neutral I guess environment all right sorry well it's been really good meeting you and we can talk about and if you wanted to get back in touch and then there'd be time to talk more about it and maybe see how things are going okay okay thank you Thank you. So I hope that's given you an idea of how I, as a therapist and counsellor, work. I wouldn't say it's a fantastic piece of work. It's, you know, 50 minutes or so of an extract and nothing massively dramatically changes. But hopefully it illustrates something about those counselling processes that over time can lead to uh, quite dramatic, quite substantial changes. And just to summarise, I guess what I'm trying to do is really help clients in the first place explore, express, <clears throat> clarify, unpack their experiences about how they experience the world, to really enter into that, at a, at not just at a cognitive level, but a, a, to get a felt sense of it, to really understand the emotion. Um, and that through that, to help clients then both express something of that, get things off their chest, feel less alone, but also to um, reevaluate how they're doing things. And, and, and some, sometimes that process of getting things off one's chest is enough but also that reflection can allow for that process of re-evaluation and of course it's not one where I'm coming in and saying you're doing that wrong or you're doing that wrong why don't you do it like that but just gently being with the client 
to help them think about is that the best way for me uh, sorry not for me as a therapist for me is if i'm the client uh, that i can be doing things and I, I think we know from the research the clients appreciate that challenge uh, most clients and, and 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 want counseling to be a space in which they can be invited to think about things in in different ways and then after that perhaps there is that process of deciding to do things in a different way or trying things out in a different way and seeing how that goes coming back to it and that change towards uh better ways of doing things sometimes when there's when when it, you know it's very embedded habits that can take a long time over therapy uh and it may be changes in actions it may be changes in how we think about things and just constantly trying to think about maybe kind of gratitudes for instance might be where somewhere a client gets to or or uh, uh, avoiding a particular relationship or all those kind of changes that sometimes take a long time to bed in but ultimately can help clients lead a life that is more fulfilling and satisfying for them and the work really comes from a place of valuing and appreciating how clients do things and and recognizing that they're doing the best that they can in, in within their world and 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 entering into that and entering into that worldview and then with them it's kind of an accelerator you know i'm not coming in as some kind of savior it's much more coming in and as a catalyst and accelerating a process that the clients were really going through of trying to think things through and bringing something more of a uh, a perspective about it one of the things we know very much from the research is that so much of change it's not about the therapist, it's about the client. So much of what determines whether therapy is effective is about <coughs> client qualities, client characteristics, like being motivated, involved, uh, having agency, being further advanced in, 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 in where change is. So the research really supports that idea that therapy isn't about um, waving a magic wand, being a saviour, doing something to someone, that some miraculous act. Um, that somebody never thought of. It's about being alongside someone, entering into their world and helping them to take forward their thinking. So I hope you found that helpful and uh, yeah, good luck with your work. <laughs>